an idea of what you'll be seeing this afternoon. Most of you are familiar with the Orson Welles show, World, War of the Worlds, that he produced in 1938. Did I go about that? One that had New York City evacuated practically. Well, he did that show on October 30th, 1938. That was Halloween Eve. And of course, that show is a great success. In fact, it was so successful that the Campbell Soup Company immediately hired Orson Welles. They created something called the Campbell Playhouse with Orson Welles as the director. Now, the first show that he came up with was the one you're going to see this afternoon. It's called Rebecca. Okay. Let me give you a little more information. Uh, so, now, he did the War of the Worlds in October of 1938. He was ready for this production, Rebecca, in December, just two months later. So he really moved ahead. Okay. He got uh, Catherine Sullivan from Coast Guard with her. So the Campbell Soup Company called the Campbell Playhouse, and you're going to hear the Campbell Soup commercials, no laugh, but the, the, the listening audience for the Campbell Playhouse was estimated at two million families. Now, in 1938, that was a major, major entertainment source. So, uh, people just came to the radio and listened to what was going to go on Sunday evening. The Campbell Playhouse did about 20 broadcasts, uh, and they featured uh, famous guest stars, uh, and they did dramatizations of popular plays, movies, and books. For example, they did A Farewell of Arms, which starred Orson Welles and Catherine Hepburn. That was in 1938. They did uh, a show called Algiers with uh, Orson Welles and Paul Edgardo in late 1938. Okay. okay, this evening, what we're going to attempt to do is to reproduce for you that very first production of Orson Welles' show called Rebecca. So here's what we can ask you to do. We'd like you to use your imagination, okay? The year is 1938. This is December the 9th. You people are the lucky ones. You waited five months to get tickets to come in to see this broadcast to see how a radio broadcast is produced, and we're going to show you here, okay? Now imagine that's it. Now, Golden Lakes Village didn't exist. 1939. So I want you to imagine that you are in the broadcast studio of a mythical radio station called WGLV. <laughs> You've waited five months to get your tickets. You're all very excited to see Orson Welles and to see how a radio program is actually done. And that's what we're going to show you tonight. Now we're going to ask for your assistance in two ways. When we go on the air, and you'll know we go on the air when the red on the air light comes on, we'll ask you to help us bring the program on the air with the flow sign. I have a flow sign. I hold it up next to you. <laughs> Following that, I have another sign which says quiet. During the broadcast, we'll ask you all to please be as quiet as mice. Okay, during the broadcast. Okay. That's really what you know about that. On the dock. Okay, so that's the background for our production. Now, in your playbill, you have a synopsis of this show. Let's we'll see what it's about. Why don't you quickly read that? Now let me introduce the cast for tonight's performance, okay? We have Helen Gruska. <laughs> followed by her sister, Bella Gruska. <laughs> we have Joanne Wiener. Why not take it by Joanne Wiener? The 
Vicente Daggio. Don't you look like Orson Welles? No, that's what we do. Hartman Barnes.
I wonder what my life would be today if Mrs. Van Hopper hadn't been a snob. Manderly, Manderly, my dear. Why, even you must have heard of Manderly. That marked the leaders at the next table to us. The man who owns Manderly. They say he can't get over his wife's death. An appalling tragedy. The papers were full of it, of course. They say he never talks about it, never mentioned his wife's name. She was drowned, you know, in a bay near Manderley. Oh, Mrs. Van Hopper, I know he can hear you. Nonsense, my dear. Go up to my room quickly and find that letter from my nephew. You know, the one written in his honeymoon with the snapshot. Bring it down to me right away. Mrs. Van Hopper, I, I don't really... Go on, my dear. Do as you've told. Don't argue. Hurry. When I came down, she had him sitting beside her on the sofa. He looked like no other man I'd ever seen. A man out of a long, distant past. Oh, there you are, my dear. This is Mr. De Winter. Mr. De Winter is having coffee with us. How do you do? How do you do? You know, I recognized you, Mr. De Winter, just as soon as you walked into the restaurant. And I thought, why? There is Mr. De Winter, Billy's friend. I simply must show him this snap snapshot. Snapshots of Billy and his bride taken on their honeymoon. Look, here are the snaps. Here they are sunbathing at Palm Beach. He met her at that party when I first met you at Claridge's in London. <laughs> uh, but I dare say you don't remember an old woman like me. On the contrary, on the contrary. I remember you very well. Excellent snapshots. The bride's very pretty. I don't think I should care for Palm Beach. Well, of course, if one had a home like Manderley, I'm told Manderley is like Fairland. There is no other word for it. I wonder you can ever bear to leave it. Mr. Van Vinter is so modest, he won't admit it. But he has one of the loveliest homes in England. They say that Min Minstrel's Gallery at Manderley is a gem, as the gardens are simply the most perfect in the whole world. The next morning, Mrs. Van Hopper woke up with a sore throat and a temperature. At noon, I went down to the restaurant alone. I expected it to be empty. Nobody lunched generally before one o'clock. He was sitting at the table next to ours. I sat down looking straight before me. I unfolded my napkin and knocked over the vase of flowers on my table. Oh, you can't sit at a wet tablecloth. Come on, get up. Wait up. This lady's going to have lunch with me. No, no, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Well, you're being polite, but really. I'm not being polite. I'd like you to have lunch with me. Oh, you're very kind. You don't believe me, eh? Well, never mind. Come on, sit down. We needn't talk to each other unless we feel like it. What's happened to your friend? She seems a good deal older than you. What is she, eh? Relation? Have you known her for long? Oh, she isn't really a friend. She's an employer. You see, I'm what's called a companion. She pays me 90 pounds a year. I didn't know you could buy companionship. Why do you do it? 90 pounds is a lot of money. How old are you? 19. And you're not afraid of the future? No. Haven't you any family? No, they're dead. Well then, we've got a bond in common, you and I. We're both alone in the world. I have no companions. 
I shall have to congratulate Miss Van Hopper. You're cheap at 90 pounds a year. You forget, you have a home, and I have none. An empty house, my dear, can be as lonely as a full hotel. The trouble is that it's less impersonal. I remember the feel of the leather seats in his car as we drove in the afternoon along the Mediterranean. I remember still my ill-fitting flannel suit and how the skirt was lighter than the coat. I remember now, glancing at my watch, I would think to myself, this moment now, now, at 20 minutes past three, this must never be lost, never. You're a very silent companion, what are you thinking? I wish, I wish I were a woman of about 36, dressed in black satin with a string of pearls. Well, you wouldn't be in this car with me if you were. Mr. De Winter, you're going to think me impertinent and rude, I dare say, but I would like to know why you ask me to come out in the car day after day. You're being kind, that's obvious. But why do you choose me for your charity? Because uh, you're not dressed in black satin with a string of pearls, nor are you 36 years old. You know it's not fair. You know everything there is to know about me. That's not much, I admit, because I haven't been alive very long and nothing very much has happened to me except people dying. But you, I know nothing more about you than I did when we met. And what did you know then? Well, that you lived at Mandalay and that you'd lost your wife. My memories are very bitter. I prefer to ignore them. Something happened to me a year ago that altered my whole life and I want to forget my existence up to that point. But those days are finished. They're blotted out. I want to begin living life all over again. Oh, I'm so sorry. You've been so kind to me. I, I didn't mean to remind you. Curse your puritanical, tight-lipped little speeches and your talk about kindness and charity. I asked you to come with me because I want you and your company. And if you don't believe me, you can leave this car now and find your own way home. Go on. Well, open the door and get out. Well, what are you going to do about it? Please, drive me home. Well, I suppose you're young enough to be my daughter. I don't know how to deal with you. You can forget all I said to you just now. That's all finished and done with. Don't let's ever think of it again. My family used to call me Maxine. I'd like you to do the same. We've been formal long enough. What do you want? Something the matter? Uh, I come to say goodbye. We're going this morning. Come in and shut the door. What are you talking about? It's true. We're leaving today. I was afraid I wouldn't see you. I thought I must see you again to thank you. Why didn't you tell me all of this before? Well, Mrs. Van Hopper only decided today. Her daughter sails for New York on Saturday, and we're going with her. She's taking you to New York. Yes, and I don't want to go. I shall hate it. I shall be miserable. Well, then why in heaven's name go? Sit down with me while I eat my breakfast that you had yours. Yes. Oh, I really haven't time. I ought to be downstairs now getting the tickets. Well, you can sit with me for five minutes. I shouldn't. So, Mrs. Van Hopper's had enough of Monte Carlo, eh? And now she wants to go home. Well, so do I. She to New York, I to Mandalay. Which would you prefer? Take your pick. Oh, please don't make a joke about it. It's unfair. If you think I'm one of those people who tries to be funny 
before breakfast, you're wrong. I repeat, the choice is open to you. Either you go to America with Miss Van Hopper, or you come home, not to Manderley, with me. Do you mean you, you want a secretary or something? I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. I don't understand. I'm not the sort of person who meant marry. What the devil do you mean by that? I'm not sure. I don't think I know how to explain. I don't belong to your sort of world. What is my world? Well, Manderly, you know what I mean. You think I'm asking you to marry me for the same reason you thought I took you out of your car, to be kind to you, right? Yes. One day you may realize that philanthropy is not one of my strongest qualities. Are you going to marry me? My suggestion doesn't seem to have gone too well with you. I'm sorry. I rather thought you loved me. I do love you. I, I love you dreadfully. I've been crying all morning because I thought I should never see you again. Ah, so that settles it then. Instead of being companion to Mrs. Van Hopper, you become mine and your duties will be almost exactly the same. I also like new library books and flowers in the drawing room and someone to pour my tea. Well, I'm being rather rude to you, aren't I? Well, this isn't your idea of a proposal. We ought to be in a conservatory with you in a white frock with a rose in your hand and a violin playing a waltz in the distance. Poor dog. What a shame. Never mind. I'll take you to this. For our honeymoon, and we'll have hold hands in a gondola. But we won't stay too long because I want to show you Manderley. Manderley. Now then, am I going to break the news to Mrs. Van Hopper? Or are you? Oh, no, you tell her. She'll be so angry. I'll tell her. I'll tell her. I'm not afraid. You wait for me here. When he'd gone, I looked around his room. There was a book on the table near his bed. I picked it up. On the title page was a dedication. Max, from Rebecca, May 17, written in a curious, slanting hand. The ink had run too thick so that the name Rebecca stood out black and strong. Rebecca, Rebecca. We pause now in our Campbell Playhouse presentation of Rebecca. In just a moment, we will resume the story. But first, here is my associate of long standing, Eloise Chappelle, with an important message. Long ago, when chicken was a rare and special treat, what magic the words chicken for dinner conjured up in our young minds, and how we look forward to these great events. With crowd gusto, father would dexterously separate wings and legs, and then carve tender white slices from the breast, while each of us silently prayed to be granted his special favorite part. And then, on the second day, there came another treat. The remaining meat and the carcasses went into mother's soup kettle, to be simmered slowly, seasoned gently, and served forth as a supper time delight. Today, if you have wistful memories of that glorious old home chicken soup, then Campbell's chicken soup is just made for you because Campbell's chefs follow faithfully the good home recipe, only changing it to make it even better soup. They use, for example, all the good meat of the chicken, fine, plump chicken, 
a heart to, such as you choose proudly for your own table, such chicken soup with snowy rice and tender chicken pieces is a special treat indeed, but one you may enjoy on any day. Your grocer has Campbell's chicken soup and it's yours for the asking. Remember Campbell's and the gardens to the sea. A servant was standing on the steps waiting, an old man with a kind face. <laughs> Well, here we are first. Everyone well? Yes, thank you, sir. Glad to see you home, sir. And hope you have been keeping well. And madame, too. Thank you. Yes, we're both well, thank you, first. Although tired from the trying, you see, and wanting our teeth. Hello, Jasper. There's a good little dog. First, who are all these people? All of the servants, I suspect? But I didn't expect this. Mrs. Danvers' orders, sir. Mrs. Danvers, I might have a guess for Come on, darling. Mrs. Danvers was Rebecca's housekeeper. She simply adored her. They're all curious to see what you're like, you know. You won't mind, will you? It won't be too long. <coughs> My dear, this is Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers took me to my room. She was a tall, gaunt woman, dressed in black, with prominent cheekbones and great, hollow eyes that gave her a skull's face, parchment white, set on a skeleton's frame. Her eyes never left Mine. Mandalay is a big place, madame. Not as big as some, of course, but big enough. And a show place. <laughs> Mr. De Winter lets the public in to see it once a month. You can't see the sea from here, can you? No, not from this room. You can't even hear it. You do not know the sea was anywhere near, not from this room. I'm sorry about that. I like the sea. Mrs. De Winter gave special orders in his letter that you would have this room, madame. Oh, then this was not his room originally? No, madame. He's never used the rooms in this wing before. Oh, he, he didn't tell me that. I, I suppose you've been at Manderley for many years, Mrs. Sanders, longer than anyone else. I came here when the first Mrs. De Winter was a bride. Mrs. Danvers, you, you, you must have patience with me, because this sort of life is new to me. You must just go on running things as they always have been run. I shan't want to make any changes. I'm here to carry out your orders, madame. I hope I shall do everything to your satisfaction. Can I do any more, anything for you now? Oh, no, thank you. I'm sure I have everything. I shall be very comfortable here. You've made the room so charming. I only followed Mr. DeWinter's instructions. Of course, the most beautiful rooms are in the west wing, overlooking the sea. Those rooms there are twice as large as this. And the windows look down across the lawn onto the sea. I suppose Mr. DeWinter keeps the most beautiful rooms to show to the public. Those rooms are never shown to the public. They, uh, they used to live in those rooms when Mrs. DeWinter was alive. That big room I was telling you about, that looks down to the sea, that was Mrs. DeWinter's room. Next morning, there was a heavy mist. It poured in through the open window. When I came down to breakfast, Maxime had already gone out. <clears throat> Mrs. DeWinter? Yes, Father? Mr. DeWinter told me to tell you, madam, that he'd be going out with Mr. Crawley. Mr. Frank Crawley is Mr. DeWinter's friend who manages the estate. Mr. DeWinter said to tell you they'd be back for luncheon at one. Thank you. Oh, Firth? Yes, ma'am. It seems rather cold this morning. I, 
I wonder if you'd please light the fire in the library for me? The fire in the library is not usually lit until the afternoon, madam. Mrs. De Winters always used the morning room. She always did her telephoning and correspondence in there after breakfast. There is a good fire in there. However, if you should wish to have a fire in the library as well. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't dream of it. I'll go into the morning room. Thank you, Fur. If you will allow me, madam, I will show you the way. This was a woman's room, graceful, fragile. The room of someone who had chosen every particle of furniture to break air. It had a strange and startling kind of perfection. I opened a drawer at hazard, and there was a letter addressed to Mrs. M. De Winter. Mrs. De Winter? Mrs. De Winter? Mrs. DeWinter? I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Mrs. DeWinter has, has been dead for over a year. It's Mrs. Danvers, madame. Mrs. Danvers, I'm speaking to you on my house telephone. It's about the menu. It's Mrs. Danvers speaking, madame. After lunch, it was still raining. Frank Crawley and Maxine were in the library working. I got a raincoat out of the flower room and started out across the garden down toward the sea. Soon I was in the woods. The dog ran on ahead. <coughs> the woods came right down to the water. At the fringe was a long, low building, half cottage, half Boathouse. There was a buoy anchored out in the cove, but no boat. And there was Jasper wagging his tail at a solitary figure on the beach. As I drew near, I saw that the figure on the beach was a shabbily dressed man. Good day. Dirty, ain't it? I'm afraid it's not very nice weather. Jasper, Jasper, come here. Digging for shells. Been digging here. Been digging all day. I, I'm sorry, you can't find any. No shells. That's right. No shells here. Come on, Jasper, good dog, come on. <coughs> he won't go. Why not? Because he ain't your dog. No. He's Mr. De Winter's dog. I want to take him back to the house. Come on, Jasper. Come along. Good dog. She ain't been here lately. What do you mean? That other one. You don't look like that other one. What do you mean, what other one? Tall and dark she was. She gave you the feeling of a snake. By night, she'd come down to the cove. I seen her. I look in on them once here in the boathouse. And she turned on me. She said, if I catch you looking at us through the windows, I'll have you put in a silo. She said, I won't say nothing, ma'am. I said to her, touch my cap like, like this here. She gone now, ain't she? gone in the sea, ain't she? She won't come back no more. No, she'll not come back. You won't put me in asylum, will you? I, I, I never said nothing. I, I did. I never said nothing, ma'am. I never said nothing. I never said nothing. Where did you get that piece of string? I, I got it for Jasper. He ran away. 
I found it on the cottage on the beach. There's a door open. I pushed it open. The string was in the other room where the sails were. I see. I see. That cottage is supposed to be locked. The door has no business being open. Did ben tell you the door was open? Ben? Oh, never mind. Never mind. Maxim. Yes, what is it? I I'm sorry I went down to the cove. If you didn't want me to go. What makes you think I didn't want you to go down there? Maxim, how should I know? I'm not a thought reader. I know you didn't want me to go, that's all. I, I can see it in your face. See what in my face? I've already told you. I can see that you didn't want me to go. You're qu quite right. You're quite right. I did not want you to go down there. Would that please you? I never go near the place. You had my memories. You wouldn't want to go there either or talk about it or even think about it. There, I hope that satisfies you. Please, Maxine, please. What's the matter? I don't want you to look like that. Please, Maxine, let's forget all we said. I'm sorry, darling. Please, let everything be all right. We ought to have stayed in Italy. We will never have to come back to Manderley. I was a fool to come back. The weather that May was wet and cold. From the terrace, I could hear the murmur of the sea below me, low and sullen. And every morning, a heavy fog would come rolling in from the sea. I could not forget that cottage on the beach and the white, lost look in Maxime's eyes. Somewhere at the back of my mind, a frightened, furtive seed of curiosity grew slowly and stealthily. Frank Crawley was in the library, taking tea with me, waiting for Maxime to get home. There were things I had to know. You, uh, 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 you been down to the cold then? Yes, Frank. Frank, in that cottage down there, are those all Rebecca's things? Yes. Well, I was wondering, why is the buoy there in the little harbor place? Uh, uh, the boat used to be born there. What boat? Her boat. Oh. What happened to it? Oh, was that the boat she was sailing when she was drowned? Yes, she capsized and sank. She was washed overboard. Couldn't someone have got out to her? Nobody saw the accident. Nobody knew she'd gone. She often sailed alone at night. How long afterward was it they found her? Oh, about two months. Where did they find her? Near Edgecombe, about 40 miles up channel. How did they know it was she after two months? How could they tell? Maxim went up to Edgecombe to identify her. Oh, Frank, I know what you're thinking. You can't understand why I asked all these questions just now. You think I'm being morbid and curious, but it's not that. I promise you, only when I go to call on all these people, his friends, I know they're looking me up and down and thinking, what on earth does Maxime see in her? Always I know that whenever I meet anyone new, they say how different she is from Rebecca. Frank? Yes? There's just one more thing. One question I must ask you. Will, will you promise to answer it quite truthfully? I'll do my best. Tell me, was Rebecca quite beautiful? Yes. Yes, I suppose she was the most beautiful creature I ever saw in my life. Here it is, Madame. This is it. One moment while I turn on the light. Come in. 
Danvers, madame. Was this her room, Mrs. Danvers? Uh, yes, ma'am. This is her room. Now you're here. Let me show you everything. I know you want to see it all. You've wanted it for a long time. It's a lovely room, isn't it? The loveliest room you've ever seen. I haven't touched a thing. There are flowers on the dressing table, and that's her bed. A beautiful bed, isn't it? Here is her nightdress. That was the nightdress she was wearing for the last time before she died. Would you like to touch it? Feel it, hold it. I did everything for her, you know. You look after me better than anyone, Danny, she, she used to say to me. I wouldn't have anyone but you. See, here's her wardrobe. What's the matter, madam? Aren't you feeling well? I'm all right. I just, I, I didn't expect to see all her things this way. I believe Mr. DeWinder liked her to wear silver, mostly. But of course, she could wear anything. She looked beautiful in this velvet. Put it against your face. It's soft, isn't it? Scent is still as fresh as though she's just taken it off. These are her slippers. Put your hands inside the slippers. They're quite small and narrow, aren't they? When they found her, the rocks had battered her to bits so no one could recognize her. <sighs> You know now why Mr. DeWinter doesn't use these rooms anymore. He hasn't used these rooms since the night she was drowned. I come up every day and dust for myself. If you want to come again, you can only tell me. Sometimes when Mr. DeWinter is away and you feel lonely, you might like to come up to these rooms and sit here. They're just beautiful rooms. You wouldn't think she'd been gone now for so long, would you? You'd think she just got went out for a little while and would be back in the evening. Do you think she can see us talking to one another now? Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I don't know. I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, hmm, if she comes back to Mandalay and watches you and Mr. DeWinter, you sitting in her chair in the library before the fire, stroking her dog, <coughs> talking to her husband. Stop it! Stop it! It's no use, is it? You can't do it. You'll never get the better of her. She's still mistress here, even if she's dead. She's the real Mrs. De Winter, not you. It's you that's the shadow and the ghost. It's you that's forgotten and not wanted and pushed aside. Well, why don't you leave Mandalay to her? Why don't you go? What do you mean? Why don't you go? We none of us want you here. He doesn't want you. He never did. He can't forget her. He wants to be alone in the house again with her. It's you who ought to be dead, and not Mrs. De Winter. Come here now to the window. Let me show you something. When the window's open, you can hear the sea down there. Look down there, look. Let me go. Don't be afraid, I won't push you. But there's not much for you to live for here, Emmanuel. Why don't you jump now and have done with it? Then you won't be an, unha an unhappy person anymore. Why don't you try? Go on, go on. Don't be afraid, go on. Go on, go on, go on. <laughs> On. Why don't you jump now and have done with it? Why don't you try? Go on. Go on. Don't be afraid. Jump. Go on. Go on. Mrs. Danvers was close behind me now, her hand on my arm. And before me was the open window and the white mist coming in from the sea. Go on. I shut my eyes. The mist lay upon my lips, rank and sour. My head began to swim, and suddenly the mist had parted. There was a flash in the sky. Someone was firing a rocket into the air. Then another rocket. Ahoy there, ship aground. Another rocket. 
ship aground, ship aground. A final rocket went off. Later, I went down to the beach. There was a large ship on the reef, half a mile offshore, with her bows pointed toward the cliffs. There were a number of small boats around her, and the Coast Guard cutter lying alongside. I heard the rockets. They both broke all the windows. Look like the Dutchman, I'd say. Dutch or German. Good thing there is no sea running. That shallow water she's in. Is she stuck? I don't know yet. They did a diver over from Kenneth. He's going to see if she was broken in two. She's in the reef. She's a goner. Have, have you seen Mr. De Winter? Not today, ma'am. Um, he, he was down? Mr. Winter? Uh, yes, ma'am. He was one of the first ones down there after the rockets went up. He was down by the cove. Had the dog with him. Do you, do you know where he is now? He went off to Carrot 20 minutes ago with one of the crew that was injured. Oh, thank you. Good day. Good day, ma'am. Good day, ma'am. I went back to Mandalay the long way through the woods. The fog had cleared. I looked down and saw the stranded ship offshore. The diver must have come up, for I saw a little group of people on the deck of the boat alongside, leaning over, staring into the water. There's a man waiting to see you, madam. He says it's important. He asked for Mr. De Winter first, and then for you. He's in the library. Who is it first? He says his name is Captain Swirl, madam. The harbor master from Carrick. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll go in and talk to him. Yes, madam. Mrs. DeWinta. I'm sorry. My husband isn't back yet. I know. I can't get a hold of Mr. Crowley either. The fact is, I've got some terrible news for Mr. DeWinta, and I hardly know how to break it to him. What sort of news, Captain Sir? Well, Mrs. DeWenta, it's, uh, it isn't very pleasant for me to tell you either. We are very fond of Mrs. DeWenta around here. It's hard on him and hard on you. That we just can't let the past lie in quiet. Yes, go on. Well, you know, we sent the diver down to inspect the ship there on the reef. Well, while he was down there, he came across something else. The hull of the little sailing boat lying on her side. Not broken up at all. He recognized it at once. That boat belonged to the late Mrs. DeWenta. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is it necessary to tell Mr. DeWenta? Couldn't the boat be left there as it is? It's not doing anybody any harm, is it? The captain door was tightly closed, and the port was closed too. The diver broke one of the windows with the stone from the sea bed and looked into the cabin, and then he got the fright of his life. There was a body in there lying on the cabin floor. Now you understand why I have to talk to your husband, Mrs. DeWinta. It's all over now. The thing has happened. What thing? The thing I've always foreseen. The thing I've dreamt about day after day, night after night. We're not meant for happiness, you and I. What are you trying to tell me? Rebecca has won. Rebecca has won. I remember her eyes. As she looked at me before she died, I remember that slow, treacherous smile. She knew this would happen. Even then, she knew she'd win in the end. Maxine, 
What are you saying? What are you trying to tell me? Her boat. They found it. The diver found it this afternoon. I know. Captain Searle was here, and he told me. You're thinking about the body. The body the diver found in the cabin. Yes. It means she wasn't alone. It means there was someone out sailing with Rebecca at the time, and you have to find out who it was. There was no one with Rebecca. She was alone. It's Rebecca's body lying there on the cabin floor. No. The woman I identified wasn't Rebecca. There never was an accident. Rebecca was not drowned at all. I killed her. I shot Rebecca in the cottage down on the cove, carried her body to the cabin, and took the boat and sunk it right there where they found it today. It's Rebecca who's lying dead there on the cabin floor. Now, you look into my eyes and tell me that you still love me. Oh, darling, we, we can't lose each other now. We've got to be together always with no secrets and no barriers between us. Please, darling, please. There's no time, there's no time. We may have a few hours, a few days. How can we be together now that this has happened? I told you, they found the boat, they found Rebecca. And what will you do? I don't know, I don't know. Does anyone know? Anyone at all? No. No one. no one but you and me? No one but you and me. Oh, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? The time we wasted when we might have been together. All these weeks, all these days. You were so aloof. You never came to me like this before. You were strange with me, awkward, shy. How could I come to you when I knew you were thinking about Rebecca. How could I ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? Whenever you spoke to me or looked at me, I thought you were saying to yourself, this I did with Rebecca, and this, and this. What are you talking about? What do you mean? It was true, wasn't it? You thought I loved Rebecca. You thought I loved her? You thought I killed her, loving her? I tell you, I hated her. Our marriage was a farce from the very first. She was villainous, damnable, rotten through and through. We never loved each other. We never had one moment of happiness together. Rebecca was incapable of love. She was incapable of tenderness, of decency. She knew how I loved Mandalay. She knew how to hurt me most. She stood there that night in the cottage in the cold, smiling at me. I'm going to have a child, she said, and it's not yours. It will grow up here in Mandalay, bearing your name. That's a joke, isn't it? And when you die, she said, Mandalay will be his. You can't prevent it. Have you ever thought how hard it would be for you to make a case against me in a court of law, I mean, if you decided to divorce me? We've acted the parts of a loving couple and wife, a loving husband and wife rather too well, haven't we? They'll say, she continued, all your friends, all those smug friends of yours and all your blasted tenants thinking it's your child. It's what we've been, what we've always hoped for. Mrs. De Winter, they'll say. And I'll be the perfect mother, Max, just as I've been the perfect wife. And none of them will ever guess. None of them will ever know it's not your child. And she turned and faced me, smiling. And then I killed her. She was smiling still, I fired at her heart. She didn't fall at once, though. She stood there looking at me, that slow smile on her face, her eyes wide open.
have heard all the testimony in this case, gentlemen. You have heard how the body of the deceased was found in the cabin of our boat. You have heard the testimony of the boat builder. You have heard Mr. De Winter's story. You have heard how, on the night of the tragedy, Mrs. De Winter went down to the cottage where she was in the habit of... Gentlemen of the jury, how do you find the verdict is suicide. Suicide without sufficient evidence that shows the state of mind of the deceased. Court is adjourned. It was almost dark when we started for Mandalay. He held my hand in his. We didn't speak for a long time. I must have dozed, for I woke suddenly with a start and heard the first sound of thunder in the air. The air was hot against my face. No rain fell. What is it, darling? Maxime, Maxime, don't drive so fast. I want to get home. I'm worried. I have a premonition of disaster. When everything's over, I don't understand. I want to get home. I want to get back to Mandalay. What time is it? Almost nine. That's funny. Looks almost as though the sun was still setting over there beyond those hills. Can't we know? It's too late. The wrong direction. You're looking east. Why, yes. That's funny, isn't it? It's in winter you see the northern lights, isn't it? Not in summer. That's, that is not the northern lights you're looking at. It's Manderley. Axiom? Maxine, what is it? I don't know. I don't know. Maxine, look, a fire. Maxine, it's Mandalay. It's burning. Mandalay is burning. This is Danvers. We have both known fear and loneliness and very great distress. But we have come through our crisis. Of course, we have our moments of depression, but there are other moments, too, when time, unmeasured by the clock, runs on into eternity. And catching Maxine's smile, I know we are together at last. Now there are no barriers between us. We can never go back. Mandalay again. The past is still too close to us. But sometimes in my dreams I go to Mandalay. I see the gray stone shining in the moonlight. Light comes from the windows. The curtains blow softly in the night air. And in the library the door stands half open as if we had just left it with my handkerchief on the table beside the bowl of autumn roses and the charred embers of our log fire still smoldering against the morning fog.